some of the first cybersecurity talks were actually given uh, between you and, and MIT, I don't know, six, eight years ago, whatever it was. But anyway, I, I direct a cybersecurity research center at MIT, uh, cybersecurity at MIT Sloan, it's at the business school. So we typically look at strategy management, uh, organizational issues around cybersecurity, uh, particular focus on the uh, industrial control system environment. Uh, so we're doing a lot of this type of work. I'll just talk to you about a couple things today that sort of are things you may have to think about tomorrow, but tomorrow comes pretty fast in, in cybersecurity. So um, in fact, the things we talked about some years ago have already come and passed. So uh, let's, so uh, just a couple uh, short things. A uh, little bit about cybersecurity and safety. I know we discussed it a lot in this conference. I've seen a lot of discussions to it. Just want to address it relatively quickly. And then talk about this sort of misconception around the hackers have the advantage, uh, but they're not well organized. And let's talk about that. But first, let's do this. Um, so we, we've been a long-term advocate of cybersecurity and safety. Uh, this been, we've been doing cybersecurity research. Actually, the uh, uh, co-founder of the center wrote a book on uh, information security in 1979. And at that time, he said that 50% of the problems will be related to human error. He was wrong. It's more like 80 or 90, as we know. But, <laughs> but in any case, so we've been doing this a little bit, a little while. And we did realize some time ago that, that there's a lot of connection with safety. We have a whole program that looks at uh, uh, cybersecurity in terms of a model called STAMP, which was originally de developed to analyze the Challenger mission and why there was an accident in the Challenger mission. Uh, it's, a, it's a system theoretical approach looking very differently at systems and why they fail. And I think it's really important to think about safety and it's really important to make the analogy, but it's not a good idea to believe entirely in it. And, and, and what's really wrong about it is Safety is about accidents. Accidents happen, there's some independence, uh, and somewhat the level of harm is by chance. And cyber attacks are entirely different. And we cannot, can't forget this. In fact, we had some discussion earlier uh, in, the, in the week about really on that side, we, we really need to think about re-engineering and uh, thinking about our IoT environments as far as just the sensors we put in and the environments that we're working in and so on, because we make these engineering principles, uh, you know, assumptions about, you know, one generator goes down, the other nine are likely not to, or this shaft won't fail unless the temperature gets too hot. And now we have all these people coming in and trying to do these strange things to our organization. And so it's an entirely different problem. So we need to step back and I guess Marty pointed out, Marty Edwards pointed out that I guess uh, Idaho Labs has such a project which I wasn't familiar with, but I think there's, um, there's a lot of room for doing that. So we're doing some work again on this. There's a whole bunch of stuff on our uh, website about the project looking at this uh, system approach to, to looking at failure and why we shouldn't. Uh, we, it's good, there's lots of analogies with safety, but we should sort of step back for a minute and realize that cyber attacks are planned, there's no independence, and people are really thinking about how to harm us the most. And that's really different than accidents. Uh, so, and the, some of the people that are trying to, thinking about harming us are uh, these sort of, these, the, these hackers. And we, we the, the word hacker, I, sometimes I use uh, uh, security researcher, which in some ways is more appropriate, but the, the term hacker is being used. And we sort of think about them as, you know, hackers, you know, this sort of a disorganized whatever. Well, what's really happening is it, it's, it's not disorganized at all. And it's really important to get that mindset that there's like really in, incredible value chain model stuff going on and they have all the support structure. In fact, I, has anyone here ever sort of dealt with maybe a ransomware or seen the customer support for that type of environment or you don't have to show your hands, but it's tremendous, it's fantastic. They really have it worked out really well and so what we've done in one of our projects is we've looked at um, software as a service on the, in the dark web uh, with regard to uh, building uh, cyber attacks. And we started with the value chain model and these are the kinds of things that, that hackers do. And in fact, most of these are well represented as, as services or training environments now. So this is a, uh, a value chain model specifically developed uh, for them. Um, hey, everyone here is familiar with the dark web, of course, yes. Anyone here ever sign on to the dark web? No one. 
No one will admit it. Okay, okay, those are the people in the room you have to watch out for. No, no, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. So what, what's provided is a service. Everyone here is familiar with the concept of software as a service, yes? So what's provided as a service on the dark web is you can pay for a service that will do phishing for you. All right, it will construct the email messages, it will send them out, it will take care of all that. All you do is pay for it and let them know where, what company you want to attack. And it will customize them in all sorts of ways that you've seen your sort of customized phishing attacks that come in and that you're well aware of. And you can just pay for that. So you don't really have to do anything. You just have to shell out some, you know, Bitcoin or whatever it may be. Uh, and these, these software services are available on various markets on the dark web. This is a, a market that was established in 2013. And you can see most of the products here are around opioids and um, ecstasy and other types of drug-like related things, but now there's a really developing a, a significant market in these services. And you can see some of the service, here's a DDoS service that you can buy for around 20 pounds uh, at the time it was available uh, in the dream market. Uh, here's a silent Bitcoin miner. This app will let you uh, create files that will mine Bitcoin on any computer victims site, uh, it's really easy to use, easy, even if you're a noob, uh, I guess the newbie, um, uh, you can do it and make money now, and this is, uh, you know, equivalent of uh, $4. And then this, this is I'm Hamdi, a vendor on Dream Market. I do not support illegal activities. All my tutorials are for security studies only. So you can sell services, but it's an interesting problem at all whether any of these services are, in fact, illegal. I mean, they are basically services on the dark web and not clear, not clear which ones are and which ones aren't. And in fact, uh, the researchers I have, we, we have a, uh, the center I have is roughly about 40 researchers. And I should just pause for a minute for a very uh, uplifting uh, concept. Um, I do a lot of recruiting at MIT. We have an undergraduate research opportunity. The students who are undergraduates get to work on research projects. It's been a really important uh, program at MIT for many, many years. Uh, I can go through the last couple, but I'll do the, the most recent. I put out uh, an ad for, some, for people to work on cyber risk management related projects. I got about 30 resumes within 10 days. Um, incredible resumes. Uh, people who either have no experience in cybersecurity and would love to get into it, or people who already have a little bit of it and, and are interested in it. But that's a really good response. And so I, I sort of, I used to think, well, I was a computer scientist before I was at a business school many years ago, and computer science at that time in the sort of late 80s didn't take off, and I always used to think we should have television shows, right? T television shows really helped doctors and lawyers in the early 80s and 70s. Everything you watched on TV was a doctor and lawyer show, and everyone became a doctor and a lawyer. But we just never really got that round of computer science shows, but we've had a pretty good round of like cybersecurity shows with Mr. Robot and some of the other shows that are out there. So maybe we're doing the right thing on TV. Um, so anyway, these are all services that are available. Um, you can money launder, you can help find targets, you can uh, buy botnet as a service. Uh, you can build your reputation as a service. And these are all available. We found examples of each of these, many examples of them. None of the vendors are in the room behind us, I can tell you right now. They are, they are not there to talk about their, their products, but they're happy to sell them to you. Uh, and and, and this is, these are all the things that we are finding. And we're continuously looking and, and uh, examining what services are available. So I want to talk just a minute about a, a case study because that's in fact uh, what the thing is is what, what section is titled, uh, and we'll just look at a, just a, the ransomware attack lifestyle for a second. Let me break down that uh, a little bit. So there were some early ransomware attacks. Actually, the interesting the first one is it, it, on record is a ransomware virus created by um, an evolutionary biologist. But that's a, a long story and goes back a ways. In the computer world, it, there, were, there were some examples of ransomware, but people wrote in 2010 that ransomware is basically dead. It's just not going to go anywhere. The general belief was it was not going to happen. And why is that? S someone help me. I'll, uh, no, no. 
you couldn't attribute it. You could attribute it. You could attribute it. That's the problem. So uh, along came the $80 million pizza, um, which was the first purchase by Bitcoin in May of 2010. And that essentially was the start of ransomware. That was the first time, I think in today's Bitcoin, that might be more like 30 million, but still uh, an expensive pizza by anyone's standard. Um, so thus ransomware took off. And in fact, this is a very complex looking circuit chart, but all it is is those surfaces, services pieced together in a circuit diagram. M many people in the room have circuit diagram background. All you can think about is input and output of the services going from one to the other. And in fact, we see all along the line, these are various services that were created that supported ransomware. And they, they just started in, in 2011 and continued on um, uh, to, to create a, a complete stack that would provide for ransomware. And they're, they're noted down here, but it's a lot to read. Really, that, that what I just showed you is basically this stack. And so if you went online to the dark web and bought these services and built a stack like this, you basically have a, a ransomware tool you can use. And we've done an ROI analysis on it. Everyone would like to be in that business as far as return. Everyone. I can guarantee you, everyone in this room and everyone that you can think of. It, it's tremendous. It's in the you know, tens of thousands, if not more, with regard to the cost of these things. So all of these are existing services. You basically just piece them together, and you have a ransomware attack. Um, we saw some thing happen at the end of 2017. Anyone recall ransomware was really going up a lot, and then anybody, it started to decline. People would pay less. The returns were not so good. People were figuring out ways to defend against it somewhat. So it was decreasing. And at the same time that that was decreasing, uh, what was going up? Bitcoin. Bitcoin was skyrocketing. So what did the people who were in the ransomware business do? And this is well noted in, the, in literature and so on. They simply replaced the payload at the top. So your ransomware payload which sat on top of that stack, simply got placed with a crypto jack jacking type of payload, and you could continue to be in business simply by putting service, the new payload service in place. I, I hope you're getting a feeling of how easy this is. Right? That's the, that's the idea here, is that one should be aware of how easy this is to create on the other side. And then the, the question, uh, the question import, important, and this is the, the crypto jacking exploding and the ransomware going down, and these are both statistics that show that increase and decline. So we're taking a look at this, and what we're doing is examining new services that come on, how they can be pieced together, trying to put together some, something that can provide some warning or some idea of what types of attacks might be created by these combining these softwares and services and stay ahead of the hackers in that way. So that's the, 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 the myth that they're not well organized should be out of your mind, hopefully, by now. They're very well organized. There was a gentleman who came from Oxford to talk to our group, uh, has a book out. I'll, for, I'll forget the name, I'm sorry, but he, he spent the last eight years of his life simply touring the world visiting groups of security researchers or hackers all over the world and understanding why they do what they do and how they do what they do, so on and so forth. So in addition to this analysis, there's a really good book out just recently, it will come to me, um, that describes the lifestyle and why they're doing it and so on. Most of it has to do with very well-educated people with not enough employment. And then, which brings up a really interesting question, those of you who may know Dan Gear in the room, uh, a long time uh, 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 researcher always thought about why not buy up all the vulnerabilities, which of course is impossible. But the way the book reads and the way he talked, it sounds like why not buy up all the hackers? And so in some ways, it, it, it's not a, a terrible concept. So, um, and we do that somewhat through our bug bounty programs and things like that. Maybe people in the audience have heard of bug bounty programs and we've done a fair amount of research on who participates in those. So I'll close. Um, they're continuously creating more attack surfaces, and I think you all are part of that. You're creating more attack surfaces. In fact, I have all my students, when they start with me, do this wonderful exercise that's going on. Have you all been on Shodan 
or something like this and go on there and find, you know, tanks with gauges that tell all about what's there. And I have to stop them short of actually trying to, to crack in. It's, it's a difficult thing, but I have to just say, you know, probably let's slow down a little bit because they get a little over overexcited. Um, Things are going to get worse, and that's sort of the news that everyone hears, and it's sort of bad news. But I think that if we understand that this is not just a technology problem, that we can't just rely entirely on our safety analysis, that the hackers are well organized and they will create these things, and we have to understand how they're working and what their business model is, by knowing this, management can take the lead, and I think we can get ahead of a fair amount of what's happening in the, in the attack industry. I'll stop with that. Thanks.